ground cherry, tomatillo, mandrake, eggplant, potato, tomato, pepper, petunia, and tobacco. Welcome to episode 29 of the Growing Space podcast. I am so glad you're here today. We are continuing our mini series on Meet the Plant Families. And we're talking all about the Solanaceae plant family or the nightshade family in today's episode. It's a great summer plant family. So I'll be sharing lots of helpful information about how to tend to some of our most beloved, most favorite, <clears throat> looking at you, tomato, plants for the summer growing season in today's episode. We're going to talk about how these little plants like to grow what shared characteristics they have, how to plan for them in your growing space at home, whether or not you should seed them or use a seedling and why. We're also going to talk a little bit about maintenance too and share just some extra fun facts along the way. So this is a great episode to be tuning into this week. It is being shared at the beginning of April, which is the very start of when we can be planting some of these frost intolerant crops. So let's go ahead and get started talking all about the Solanaceae plant family. Welcome to the Growing Space podcast. I'm your host, Farmer Erin, owner of The Patio Farmer, and I believe that no matter what size space you have, you can grow food at home. Tune in every Tuesday as I share my best tips, tricks, and encouragement for tending to homegrown edible plants. I'm here to support your food growing journey. The Growing Space podcast is sponsored by Plant Club by The Patio Farmer. Plant Club by The Patio Farmer is a monthly subscription service I started in 2020. It's a membership-based opportunity to take your growing journey to the next level. With four different membership options, you get to decide the amount and kind of support that's right for you. All Plant Club members receive access to my online community through a platform called Circle. Having access to this platform allows members to share pictures, ask questions, celebrate harvests, and get to know each other. All Plant Club members also have access to free seeds each month, along with information on how to plant and tend to their crops, with seeding instructions and downloadable resources, from the Patio Farmers Resource Library. Membership starts at just $14 a month. Join Plant Club today by visiting my website, thepatiofarmer.com slash membership. So the Solanaceae plant family is also referred to as the nightshade family. And there is some debate out there in the world as to why these plants are nicknamed the nightshade family. A fun little fact about the fruit that form from members of the nightshade family is that the fruit do actually prefer to mature and grow under a little bit of shade, which is why most of these plants have fairly large, broad leaves. And as you are tending to these plants, especially tomatoes, which can require some more hands-on care throughout the growing season, but you want to be extra mindful about how you are supporting healthy fruit ripening and making sure that you provide enough shade from the leaves on the plants to help the fruit ripen. So there is a a fairly strong connection between members of the Solanaceae plant family and their fruit, their ripening fruit, and the role of shade, which is kind of interesting because all of these plants require a lot of sunlight to grow and to thrive. The Solanaceae plant family has over 2,000 members in it, so it's a fairly substantial plant family. And like I mentioned at the top of this episode, our most common Edible members of this family include the ground cherry, which is absolutely a delight. If you've never sampled a ground cherry, I would encourage you to give it a try this year. 
I do have seeds. I'll just go ahead and mention I do have seeds for ground cherries in my online store. I'll put a link in today's show notes if you want to check it out. The tomatillos. So tomatillos are also members of the nightshade family. Um, and ground cherries and tomatillos kind of grow similarly. So they they both have that little like lantern, outer papery covering around them which I think is really cute. And it's really fun to watch the fruit grow inside of that paper covering. And then of course, we've got the potato is a member of this plant family. I bet some of you listening to this episode today did not realize that a potato and a tomato are related. Then you have eggplant that are a member of the Solanaceae plant family, peppers as well, all kinds of peppers, all the peppers bell peppers, spicy peppers, sweet peppers. They're all members of the Solanaceae plant family. Petunias, while not commonly thought of as an edible plant, are members of the Solanaceae plant family. And I know some people who eat the petals, just the petals of petunia flowers and tobacco. Tobacco is very closely related to potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant peppers, etc. Now, Another little fun fact, if you were to take a gander at the tobacco hornworm, mm, mm, starting off with a bang, the tobacco hornworm, and then you were to look at the tomato hornworm, they look pretty similar. So again, I am really enjoying sharing this mini series with all of you because I do think it is just so important that as much as we can to understand the similarities of how edible plants grow and, you know, understanding who's related to each other and what shared characteristics different plants have help us to better anticipate their needs, their desires, how they want to grow as we tend to them in our growing spaces. Some other characteristics of the Solanaceae plant family the main edible part of these plants is the fruit, right? Like we think about eating the fruit of all of these plants. We do not think about eating the leaves. The leaves of many of these plants is actually, you know, if not toxic in large quantities, then just really, really off-putting. And so I would not recommend eating the leaves of any of the Solanaceae plants. Fruit is where it's at. Last week, when we were talking about the Cucurbitaceae plant family, if you missed last week's episode and you're interested in growing cucumber, squash, melon, zucchini, any of those uh, this season, I would strongly encourage you to go back and listen to that episode. But in last week's episode, I shared that you know, the members of the Cucurbitaceae plant family, they require a lot of pollination and very detailed, very complete pollination in order to transfer pollen from a male flower to a female flower to produce fruit. A difference between the Cucurbitaceae plant family and the Solanaceae plant family is that most members, if not all members, of the Solanaceae plant family contain what's called a perfect flower. And basically what that means is that within each flower, there are both male and female parts. So pollination doesn't have to be as detailed or as intentional, let's say, with members of the Solanaceae family in order to get fruit or have successful fruit form on your plants. And there's a lot more of an opportunity for like the wind to pollinate these plants. So it it takes a little pressure off of our pollinators, even though our pollinators are delightful creatures that we want to encourage in our growing spaces. Members of the nightshade, the Solanaceae plant family, they can easily pollinate, self-pollinate themselves in the wind. So just a fun little fact for you there. Another benefit of having a quote unquote perfect flower (laughs) is that wherever you see a flower on the plant, you will get a fruit from that flower. Again, contrasting that with the members of the Cucurbitaceae plant family, Not everywhere where you see a flower on those plants will you get a fruit. One kind of interesting fact that I will call out specifically about tomatoes 
Other members of the Solanaceae plant family do not share this characteristic as uh, blatantly as, as tomatoes do, but all tomatoes contain on their stems and stalks, they have what are called root hairs that cover the entire plant. When you're going to plant your tomatoes this season, take a look for those little root hairs because they cover the main stalk of the plant. They cover the leafing arms of the plant and they just look like little fuzzy, like peach fuzz really. And wherever those root hairs touch the soil, they will grow roots, which is super cool. So that kind of leads in nicely to talking about how to plant and how to prepare your space for tomatoes and other members of the Solanaceae plant family. So when you go to plant your tomatoes, you want to make sure that you plant them deep, which means you are planting those root hairs down into the soil so that you can get more uh, exposure of the plant with the soil to produce strong, more complex root systems for you. So that's just a little tidbit, you know, a little insight on how to grow some super healthy, super strong tomatoes. Now, other members, like I said, other members of this plant family, like tomatillos or eggplant peppers, you can't really plant them as deeply as you do a tomato because they don't have the root hairs. Let's talk about getting your space ready for members of this plant family. Solanaceae's, they do not do well if we get a frost. So it is still fairly early in the season to be planting these. We did just celebrate our last average frost date here in the Hardiness Zone 8A. For those of you who are brand new to this podcast, first of all, welcome. Super glad you're here. I would encourage you to go back and listen to my very first episode. I introduced myself and share a little bit more about me and my background, not only as the patio farmer, but just as a food grower in general. I'm so super glad you're here. But I live, if you are brand new to this podcast, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is part of the USDA Agricultural Zone 8A which means we have a fairly mild climate. We have very hot, humid summers, but we are able to grow food at home all year round. There's always something to be harvesting, always something to be tending. And here, we just celebrated our last average frost date on Friday. So that means that now through like mid-May, I would say, we have a 30% chance that we could still receive a frost or a freeze. And I say all of that to say that if you plant your tomatoes before Mother's Day and you live in this hardiness zone, I will put a link in today's show notes for the map to the USDA hardiness zone kind of outline. So if you do live in the United States, you can use that as a reference to understand your hardiness zone, and when you can plant certain crops, specifically ones that are frost intolerant. So if you are going to be planting members of this plant family now through about mid-May, you want to make sure that you're checking that 10-day forecast pretty consistently. I check the 10-day forecast like at least three times a week. (laughs) And you should probably get in the habit of doing that as well. It's super informative. And right now it can tell you if you need to go out and cover your Solanaceae plants, uh, your Cucurbitaceae plants. So those plants from last week's episode also benefit from being covered if we do get a frost or a freeze. Uh, so keep that in mind as you are putting together your plants. And you know if you want something that's a little bit less maintenance at the beginning, maybe you wait a couple weeks to plant these plants. But if you're up for the challenge and you're okay checking and tending to that forecast, then by all means, have at it. You can start planting these if you live in the Southeast. So I just call out that timing note. Anytime our plants are producing a fruit that requires a ton of energy. So our plants that produce fruit that we eat need lots and lots of sunlight to be happy and healthy. 
So when it comes to members of the Solanaceae plant family, you want to be giving your plants as much sunlight as you possibly can. A minimum, I would say, of eight hours of direct sunlight. That's not sunlight that's being dappled through trees. That is strong, bright, warm, toasty, life-giving sunshine. If you can get 10 hours of direct sun in your space, that is even better. There is no such thing as too much sunlight for your plants. And they will just, especially these plants, they will just appreciate every single minute, every single second that you can offer them. So pick your sunniest spot to put members of this plant family. If you happen to have like maybe six hours of direct sunlight, I wouldn't say that your plants will not grow, but they will definitely be less productive and they won't be as strong or resilient against pests or disease if they're in a more shady spot. So really like eight to 10 hours is your ideal sunlight exposure for members of the Solanaceae plant family or just wherever you get the most sun in your space. When it comes to planting these plants, I don't know if you have ever seen a tomato plant growing or a tomatillo or an eggplant, but these plants are pretty massive. They're huge plants. They get super tall. Some of them, some of our tomatoes get super tall and others, they just take up a lot of space. They take up a lot of vertical space. They take up a lot of horizontal space. And when you plant them at the beginning of the season, you look at them and you're like, oh, you're so cute. You're so tiny. Like, it's going to take you a while to grow. Like, I'm going to just put you here and then I'm going to nestle another one, like maybe a foot away. Yeah, these plants grow super fast and they get super big. My recommended spacing for members of the Solanaceae plant family is two to three feet um, of space between one another. If you're growing members of this plant family in containers, then you want to think of a soil volume of about five gallons per plant. And if you're growing them in a raised bed, you want a soil depth of at least 10 inches in your raised bed honestly, like going up to 16 or 18 inches would be even better for these plants. But that's kind of the spacing and soil volume that you want to be looking out for here. My justification for spacing out members of this plant family, two to three feet. I mean, that's a lot of room if you're working with like one four by eight raised bed. The reasoning behind the spacing is you know, the more space that you have between your plants, the more airflow you're encouraging all around, which is important for keeping your soil dry, not too dry, but just not like overly saturated or like stagnant air. That's a great invitation for fungal spores to pop up and a great little sheltered area for bugs to show up too. So making sure that you have lots of airflow all around your plants is super important. Also, the more access to direct sunlight your plant has all around it, the less hospitable your plant is going to be for those bugs and fungal spores as well. Sunlight is a natural disinfectant. You know, UV rays, they're powerful and they protect us from so much and they clean up so much. So even even having those strong sun rays all over your plant is going to be super helpful to you as you carry on and march on through the summer season. So two to three feet, lots of soil volume, lots of space. When in doubt, give your plants more space than you think that they need. Now, that is not to say that you can't plant things in between your tall, big plants because you certainly can. You know, basil, marigolds, green onion, radishes even, or like a little blanket of lettuce, summer lettuce. These are all wonderful things to plant in and around members of the Solanaceae plant family, especially around your tomatoes, as tomatoes tend to encourage visitors of all kinds. You can have 
you know, bunny rabbits coming in to visit your tomatoes. You can have uh, squirrels, birds, deer, and of course, insects and caterpillars coming in to visit your tomatoes. So planting, you know, some fragrant things in and around your tomato plants in particular can be really helpful in trying to keep those visitors away. And that's called companion planting. I feel like I've talked about companion planting at least once or twice in this podcast. I go in a lot of detail on companion planting in my master class called The Six S's to Success. And if you want to learn more about that, it is available to everyone everywhere. And I will put the link to learn more about my masterclass and how to sign up for your access to all the great resources that I've tucked into that in today's show notes. So take a look for that there. But also on the topic of companion planting, peppers are a fantastic companion plant as well. They grow beautifully next to tomatoes and eggplant. Peppers, especially hot peppers, ones like cayenne pepper, jalapeno pepper, ghost pepper, different chilies, Tabascos, all of those hot peppers are fantastic tools to keep in mind to plant next to other plants as companion plants, specifically to help repel deer, bunnies, and squirrels from your plants because they do not like those spicy flavors. They don't like those spicy oils and um, essences that are in those plants. And so when you're able to kind of mix around your hot peppers with your tomatoes, you can help kind of disguise what's actually growing and discourage other visitors from enjoying your fruit before you get to. Uh, so just a fun little fun little uh, pro tip there is to plant your hot peppers in and around your tomatoes especially. Let's see, what else? So when it comes to your soil and getting ready uh, to put your members of the Solanaceae plant family in soil, you want to make sure that you have a well-balanced soil nutrition profile going on. So you want to make sure that you have added a nice healthy layer of compost I usually like to do an inch or two of fresh, well-aged, mature compost on top of my existing soil. If you are using a fresh bag or load of soil this season, you don't have to worry about adding compost. The next season that you go to plant, then you can add a little compost to reinvigorate your soil. And I like to add for my existing soils, like I said, an inch or two of fresh compost right on top. I mix that in. And then for members of the Solanaceae plant family, they really do benefit from having a well-balanced vegetable and tomato plant food added to the soil. So I have a favorite plant food that I like to use. It's called Compost Complete. And it's produced by one of my one of my favorite farmers here in the Charlotte area, Mary Roberts. She's the owner of Windcrest Farm in Monroe, North Carolina. And she um, is certified organic and she produces a certified organic plant-based plant food for tomatoes. It's called Compost Complete for Terrific Tomatoes. And it's very well balanced. It's got lots of yummy nutrients in it. And most importantly, it has, well, a couple of great things that the Compost Complete has in it. It has trace minerals, so you get a very well-balanced, you know, we're not just focusing on the main nutrients that plants need, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but there's also a lot of trace elements and minerals in this plant food that are really supportive for plant health and growth. But then, of course, it does have uh, really healthy, clean sources of nitrogen. It also has some rock phosphate which is a natural um, mineral-based source of phosphorus. Phosphorus is one of the macronutrients that plants need to grow and thrive. And it's the nutrient that tells the plant to produce strong root systems. So anytime you're growing root vegetables, it's very important that you add a decent amount of rock phosphate or another source of phosphorus to your soil 
but it also produces, helps the plant to produce seed, which of course is found in the fruit. So anything that you are eating the fruit of primarily or solely, uh, you want to make sure that you have a healthy balance of phosphorus also in the soil. So um, using a tomato and vegetable plant food will give you that nice introduction of phosphorus and help to rebuild that nutrient content in your soil before you plant. If you are not local to Charlotte, then some other plant foods that I really like using, I mean, by default, I am an organic grower. So any organic plant food is usually my next go-to if for some reason I can't get a hold of compost complete. Rarely happens. But some other plant food companies that you could look at are Job's Organics. Boma does a great organic plant food. Lots of different varieties there. There's Dr. Earth, which I think is organic. I would have to double check that, but they're definitely like a more all-natural brand. There is Happy Frog. I love Happy Frog. Their parent company is Fox Farm, and they're based out of Humboldt County in California. And then another great like plant food company is called Down to Earth. And a lot of their products come in compostable cardboard boxes, which I think is really considerate. And they have a vegan plant food, which would be probably most comparable in terms of like content and ingredients as the compost complete from Windcrest Organics. And the reason why I am a proponent of vegan plant foods or plant-based plant foods <laughs> is because I have dogs. And there's a lot of ingredients in non-vegan, non-plant-based plant foods that dogs find really attractive and delicious. And sometimes they get into your plant food after you've applied it all over your growing space in your backyard and it can upset their tummy tums. And that's just no fun for literally anybody. So that's why I always go for the or or I mean, I always go for organic, but that's also why I go for plant-based for my sake and my dogs. Um, So just keep that in mind. But as you're growing throughout the season, especially these plants that produce a lot of fruit, again, like I said, earlier, you know, it takes a lot of resources and a lot of energy for these plants to produce for you. So if you can support them and give them extra plant food throughout the growing season, then that helps them feel supported and produce more fruit for you. You're kind of reinvigorating those nutrients for them. And especially if you're growing in containers, you want to get in the habit of feeding members of the Solanaceae plant family at least once a month, maybe every six weeks, but at least once a month, or I'm sorry, you should be feeding members of the Solanaceae family at least every six weeks. Best practice would be to do that once a month with a dry granular plant food, like the ones that I had mentioned. And I'll put some links in today's show notes for some great like summertime plant foods that are perfect for these members of the Solanaceae plant family. The conversation of whether to use a seed versus seedling for these plants. If you are growing tomatillos and ground cherries, these plants grow beautifully from seed. They grow super fast, you know, relatively so. They grow very quickly and do great just planted directly from seed. Potatoes. Let's talk about potatoes and how you plant these little spuds. My recommendation would be to purchase some seed potatoes. These are specific spuds, specific tubers that have been grown to be seeds. So they are They're not a hybrid variety. They're most likely an heirloom variety or a pure form of the variety that you are going to grow. And the reason why you would not want to use a hybrid is because hybrids don't technically exist in nature. They have to be created. They have to be crossed. Two varieties have to be crossed to create a single fertile generation from this cross, which is what we end up eating. And most of our store-bought produce 
are hybrids. So whenever someone says, yeah, I'm going to take something that I bought in the store and I'm going to try to plant it and see what happens. First of all, well done. I love an experiment. So please do that. It's a great learning opportunity. Second, please don't be disappointed if you don't get what you expect uh, from your harvest. Because like I said, most of our store-bought produce is a hybrid. Just because it's a hybrid doesn't mean it's not organic. So even if you get organic potatoes and you try to plant them and grow them out and you're disappointed with your yields, it can still be a hybrid and be organic at the same time. Usually hybrid vegetables, hybrid plants are bred for a specific reason. So there's some kind of trait that the geneticists are trying to encourage to be more demonstrative. This could be a like disease resistance. This could be a production quality. There's all different reasons why you would hybridize a crop. And it's not necessarily a bad thing either. It usually just helps to increase successful production. But the cross will only produce one productive generation. And then after that, if you were to try to plant a hybrid crop, you will get most likely the traits of one of the parents, but not both of the parents, which is what you're probably expecting. So I just like to throw that out with potatoes. So try to find seed potatoes. It'll give you much more consistent yields. Some people, whenever they get their seed potatoes, they like to cut them to help that that purchase go a little further in their planting. So they will cut the seed potatoes very cleanly so that each piece has like three to four eyes. So the eyes that you see on potatoes that maybe have been left in the pantry a little too long. Those are actually sprouts, like potato sprouts, the plant is trying to trying to grow. So some people will like make cuts and have pieces with multiple eyes on them and then allow those cuts to cure or kind of create a little scab, like a little protective coating around the cut before you plant them. Now, when you're planting potatoes, seed potatoes, it is important to add a little extra rock phosphate, a little extra phosphorus. Again, because the goal with growing potatoes, of course, is to get strong, healthy roots. And phosphorus is a super supportive nutrient, macronutrient for growing roots. There's my guidance on seed versus seedling with growing potatoes. Now, eggplant, tomatoes, and peppers... These are all crops that take a really long time, relatively speaking, to grow and mature. They're also sensitive to heat and humidity as they start to grow. You can start these from seed at home. If you choose to start your eggplant, tomatoes, and peppers from seed, it's best to start those inside 60 days before you want to transplant them outside. It's early April now, so technically you could do some seed starting and be able to plant your tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant in early June, which is still perfectly on time, perfectly acceptable timing. (laughs) And I do have, I did put some indoor seeding kits in my online store earlier this year, and right now I'm running a little sale on them. So if you are interested in doing some seed starting and you want, you know, a little kit to help you. I have some available in my online store. You get a little seeding tray and some expandable peat pots that you can pop your seeds into. There's a little greenhouse dome with a vented top. And I also include some grow light bulbs. Super cool. You can fit them into any lamp you have and it turns it into a grow light. Yep. Super neat. So if you're interested in grabbing a kit, maybe some tomato seeds, check out the link in today's show notes to my online store for those. But unless, so, you know, if you're starting these from seed, you're at peppers, tomatoes, and eggplant from seed inside, it's 60 days. And there's a whole process for making sure that your plants are growing nice and strong. And then, you know, kind of transitioning them from their cozy little indoor plant nursery into the great wild outside. So this transition period is called hardening off. 
And it usually takes about two weeks, but basically you are gradually step by step converting them from indoor plants to outdoor plants. And the last thing that you do is plant them outside after that two week period. So it's just a very gradual transition from their little inside cozy home. Usually I start by like turning off the heat mat or, you know, instead of running the grow lights, maybe they're taking some time outside in the middle of the day and then, you know, kind of gradually increasing their outside time, (laughs) you know, maybe by like a couple hours every day, but still bringing them inside at night. And then, you know, maybe towards the end of that two week period, like when you're about ready to plant, leaving them outside the whole time, even at night to get fully acclimated to nighttime temperatures. But that hardening off period is really, is really helpful and really important to go from that controlled growing environment that you are controlling inside to the outdoors, which you can try (laughs) to have some control over, but it's a lot harder. (laughs) Yeah. So if you're not starting those from seed, then 100%, I would recommend buying seedlings from a trusted source, um, you know, somewhere that you have either bought seedlings from in the past or that come, you know, the place comes with a recommendation from somebody. If you have access to organic plants, that's always my go-to. It doesn't have to be yours, but I like using organic plants when I can find them. And again, if you're local to the Charlotte area, check out my online store because I've got a lot of stuff posted up there now. (laughs) We've talked about seed versus seedling, spacing, how they grow, some shared characteristics. Now, when it comes to maintenance, I want to touch on this briefly because I have a feeling that I'm going to be doing an entire podcast episode on tomato care and maintenance as we get closer to June and July. But I will just touch here that tomatoes in particular are super prone to fungal disease. Now, the plus side is that the tomato is the most finicky, the most particular plant of this plant family when it comes to pests and disease. For whatever reason, tomatillos, eggplant, peppers, they're all super easygoing. You know, when people ask me, like, what is the best plant to start growing at home if I'm brand new to growing food? I always say it's a pepper because they are resilient, they don't mind the heat, and they don't have a lot of pest and disease issues. Tomatoes, on the other hand, do have a lot of pests and disease issues. You know, everything from the tomato hornworm to, you know, the, you can get tomato aphids, you can get like fruit worms in your tomatoes. I mean, there's just, there's a whole plethora. And then of course you have blight, you have late blight, early blight, you have septoria leaf spot. These are all fungal diseases and very, very common. If you're growing tomatoes at home, you are going to have at least one, if not two or three, or maybe all of these pests and disease issues on your tomatoes. So my best advice to tending to your tomatoes and keeping them nice and happy and healthy, two things. First of all, is make sure that you're giving them that spacing, that two to three feet of space between plants is your number one preventative solution to pests and disease for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Ventilation, access to sunlight, super important. Then secondly, is just, I'd I'd really encourage you to just get to know your plants, spend time with them every day if you can is great. If you can't do every day, then maybe every other day or every two days, but don't forget about them. Go out, check on them, see where the new growth is, see what's happening. And as you are, pay attention to those bottom leaves. You can even like take a peek underneath those bottom leaves. That's where you'll see bugs show up generally first because it's closest. Those are the leaves that are closest to the soil. Our bugs come up from the soil and our fungal spores come up from the soil. If you see 
strange spots on your leaves, take a moment. Don't touch them because it could be a fungal outbreak. Maybe snap a picture, do some research, figure out if it is a fungal disease on your plant. If it's a fungal disease, you do not want to touch that diseased area just yet. You want to be prepared. You want to go get your supplies. You want a trash bag. You want a nice clean pair of snips or harvest shears. You want some neem oil or some kind of uh, fungicide spray. Um, In a pinch, you can use hydrogen peroxide or a vinegar of your choice. But you want to have something that you can use to disinfect things because fungus spreads through contact. (laughs) So you touch a an infected part of your plant and then you go and you touch a healthy part of your plant you could have transmitted this fungal disease to other parts of your plant so those are my two biggest pieces of advice is to space your plants and then get to know your plants and if you suspect you have a fungal disease pause like don't immediately take action take a moment Figure out, confirm if you have a fungal disease like late blight or early blight or the septoria leaf spot. As I mentioned, I'm sure I'm going to do an entire episode about fungal disease and pests on tomatoes because it's a hot topic. But for now, that's what I would recommend. With tomatoes as well as sometimes eggplants, sometimes peppers, once they start to produce fruit and carry a little bit more weight, on their plants, they can benefit from having a stake or a trellis of some sort, some kind of support to help them grow and and hold on to those fruits. So, and there's tons of different ways that you can stake and trellis your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplant. I like using just garden stakes. I am not a tomato cage girl. I'm sorry. I'm just not. I find them <laughs> I find them kind of irritating to deal with. My plants always outgrow my tomato cages. They fall over. Like it's just a mess to get in there and try to work your plants. So I am not a huge uh, fan of the tomato cage over here, but I do love a nice bamboo steak or, you know, a green plastic garden steak. Wooden steaks are great. I like an A-frame trellis. There's all different ways. An archway trellis is super dreamy. So yeah, supporting your plants, again, that helps with airflow as well and access to sunlight, as well as supporting those heavy fruits. One other thing, as you are watering your members of the Solanaceae plant family, make sure as you're watering that you're watering the soil around the plant and not directly over the plant itself. Again, this just goes back to trying to keep your leaves nice and healthy and resilient against those fungal spores. So trying to keep the leaves as dry as possible. Obviously, there's going to be rain and you're going to get a little splash from as you're, you know, watering at the soil. But as much as you can to keep most of the leaves dry as you are watering consistently, the more healthy and happy your plants are going to be. So watering right at the base of the plant, the soil, water the soil, not the plant. Before we close out, let's just chat really quickly about eggplant. (laughs) I kind of skipped over eggplant a little bit. Eggplant definitely has a wonderful space and moment in the summer growing space. It is probably one of my most favorite plants to watch grow. It is just so incredible and delightful. It produces these like light purple flowers. And then from those flowers, you can start to watch this like beautiful purple fruit form. They're really pretty exquisite plants to watch grow. They are not prone to fungal disease like their cousin, the tomato. And they have very minimal pest issues. The most common issues that I see on my eggplant are white flies towards the end of the season anyway. So definitely a moment for eggplant. If you're into it, plant some. (laughs) Okay, so we're nearing the end of today's episode. I hope that you have learned some new information, new insight about members of the Solanaceae plant family. 
This was just a quick revisit to the Plant Family uh, mini series. So we're taking another little break from it. And in next week's episode, I am so excited. You guys, I sat down with my good friend, Craig LaHoulier, uh, a couple weeks ago over the winter, like we were all just starting our tomato babies at the time. And if you don't know who Craig LaHoulier is... I will put a little teaser. I'll put his website in today's show notes on Instagram, on social media. He goes by the NC Tomato Man. And he is just a super modest, super knowledgeable, super generous human gardener. I've never met anyone who knows more about tomatoes than Craig. Like, he has a super impressive resume with growing tomatoes. He is a published author. He wrote a book called Epic Tomatoes. He did a show with PBS's Joe Lample all about growing Epic Tomatoes. It's incredible. He is a tomato breeder. So if you've ever heard of a dwarf tomato, he is the one who really popularized those plants. And he has bred, I think, close to like 80 different varieties or helped to breed 80 different varieties of dwarf tomatoes, which are all hybrids. So he does really, really cool things with tomatoes. And he also, which I think is like kind of the coolest thing, he is the one who named the Cherokee Purple Heirloom Tomato. He's just a huge advocate for growing heirloom tomatoes, carrying on their legacies, telling their stories. And I mean, he's just a wealth of information. So anyway... I sat down with my pal, Craig LaHoulier, and we chatted. We could, every time we get on a call, we could just like chat for hours, it feels, but we kept it kind of (laughs) short, kind of. And I am going to share with you our conversation next week. And he is going to drop so much tomato knowledge. You don't want to miss it. Be sure to like tune in, subscribe to this podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to share the podcast with a friend so that they can be on the lookout for the conversation with Craig next week. But yeah, I'm really excited to share that conversation with you all and introduce you to Craig if you don't know him already. He's a gem. If you have listened to the show in the past, then you'll know that I like to close out each episode with a fun little fact or story from me, my growing space, et cetera, et cetera. And this week, I'm going to share with you that I did something kind of exciting over the weekend for the very first time. And I gave all of my house plants a little spa day. Well, I will also preface that not all plant ladies are all plant ladies, meaning that just because you're really good with your edible plants does not mean that you are super great with your house plants. I have had more casualties of houseplants than I would like to admit. And here I am sharing this on my podcast. But they're a totally different beast. It's a totally different animal taking care of houseplants. And I attended a class led by one of my good friends, Veronica. She has a company that's basically like the patio farmer, my company. But instead of doing edible plants, she does houseplants. So obviously, we have a lot to bond over and chat about. But she taught a class and I went to it because I needed some tips to help like keep my plants thriving. And she dropped some great knowledge. I will put a link to her website and an upcoming class if you're in the Charlotte area and you want to go check out her houseplant class. She gave some great tips and she was like, yeah, when it's nice and warm and sunny out, you should take all of your houseplants outside and spray them down. It's a great way to dust them off, get some of, you know, the winter ick off of them, you know, off of those leaves, get some um, more exposure to sunlight that way. And she had a great recommendation for feeding your house plants, as well as some other great maintenance tips. She's just so wonderful. So I, I did that on Saturday. I'm happy to report that I have over 30 house plants that are happy and thriving and looking so much better now that we had our little spa day. So spring is definitely springing and there's so much to do with our plants, both the indoor ones and the outdoor ones, whatever plants we have in our growing spaces. So on that note, I will let you go. And I will see you back here next week for the conversation with Craig LaHoulier, the NC Tomato Man. 
And in the meantime, I hope that you enjoy all of the moments that you are able to spend with your plants. And yeah, see you back next week. Thanks again for tuning into this week's episode of the Growing Space Podcast. I hope that you learned something new and that you were able to take this new information home with you and implement into your growing journey and into your growing space. As always, I am here to support you and your food growing journey. If you'd like to learn more about the different services and resources and membership programs that I run through The Patio Farmer, please check out my website, thepatiofarmer.com. You can also follow me on social media. I am on Facebook, Instagram, and oh my gosh, most recently, TikTok. Wow. I know. I know. Here I am. Patio Farmer is on TikTok. It's very exciting. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give it a like or a rating or a review if you want. Maybe share a little comment about your favorite part of the episode. Share it with a friend. The more interactions I get with my little podcast online, the more I'm able to help people just like you in their food growing journeys. As always, thanks for being here and I will see you again next week.